Chapter Eleven of A Tangled Tale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October two thousand and nine. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll. Chapter Eleven. Appendix. A knot," said Alice. "Oh, do let me help to undo it." Answers to Knot One. Problem. Two travellers spend from three o'clock till nine in walking along a level road, up a hill, and home again, their pace on the level being four miles an hour, uphill three, and downhill six. Find distance walked, also, within half an hour, time of reaching top of hill. Answer. Twenty-four miles, half past six. Solution. A level mile takes a quarter of an hour, uphill one-third, downhill one-sixth. Hence, to go and return over the same mile, whether on the level or on the hillside, takes half an hour. Hence, in six hours, they went twelve miles out and twelve back. If the twelve miles out had been nearly all level, they would have taken a little over three hours if nearly all uphill a little under four hence three and a half hours must be within one half an hour of the time taken in reaching the peak thus as they started at three they got there within half an hour of half past six twenty-seven answers have come in of these nine are right sixteen partially right and two wrong the sixteen give the distance correctly, but they have failed to grasp the fact that the top of the hill might have been reached at any moment between six o'clock and seven. The two wrong answers are from Gertie Vernon and a nihilist. The former makes the distance twenty-three miles, while her revolutionary companion puts it at twenty-seven. Gertie Vernon says they had to go four miles along the plain and got to the foot of the hill at four o'clock they might have done so i grant but you have no ground for saying they did so it was seven and a half miles to the top of the hill and they reached that at a quarter before seven o'clock here you go wrong in your arithmetic and i must however reluctantly bid you farewell seven and a half miles at three miles an hour would not require two hours and three quarters a nihilist says let x denote the whole number of miles y the number of hours to hilltop therefore three y equals the number of miles to hilltop and x minus three y equals the number of miles on the other side you bewilder me the other side of what of the hill you say but then how did they get home again however to accommodate your views we will build a new hostelry at the foot of the hill on the opposite side and also assume what i grant you is possible though it is not necessarily true that there was no level road at all even then you go wrong you say one y equals six minus the quantity x minus three y divided by six two x over four and a half equals six i grant you one but i deny two it rests on the assumption that to go part of the time at three miles an hour and the rest at six miles an hour comes to the same result as going the whole time at four and a half miles an hour but this would only be true if the part were an exact half that is if they went uphill for three hours and downhill for the other three which they certainly did not do the sixteen who are partially right are agnes bailey f k fifi g e b h p kit m e t mysey a mother's son nairam a redruthian a socialist spear maiden t b c vis inertiae and yak of these f k fifi t b c and vis inertiae do not attempt the second part at all f k and h p give no working the rest make particular assumptions 
such as that there was no level road, that there were six miles of level road, and so on, all leading to particular times being fixed for reaching the hilltop. The most curious assumption is that of Agnes Bailey, who says, Let x equal the number of hours occupied in ascent, then x and a half equals the hours occupied in descent, and 4x over 3 equals the hours occupied on the level. I suppose you were thinking of the relative rates, uphill and on the level, which we might express by saying that, if they went x miles uphill in a certain time, they would go 4x over 3 miles on the level in the same time. You have, in fact, assumed that they took the same time on the level that they took in ascending the hill. Fifi assumes that, when the aged knight said they had gone four miles in the hour on the level, he meant that four miles was the distance gone, not merely the rate. This would have been, if Fifi will excuse the slang expression, a cell, ill-suited to the dignity of the hero. And now descend, ye classic nine, who have solved the whole problem, and let me sing your praises. Your names are Blythe, E.W., L.B., A Marlborough Boy, O.V.L., Putney Walker, Rose, Seabreeze, Simple Susan, and Money Spinner. These last two I count as one, as they sent a joint answer. Rose and Simple Susan and Co. do not actually state that the hilltop was reached sometime between six and seven, but, as they have clearly grasped the fact that a mile ascended and descended took the same time as two level miles, I mark them as right. A Marlborough boy and Putney Walker deserve honorable mention for their algebraical solutions being the only two who have perceived that the question leads to an indeterminate equation. E.W. brings a charge of untruthfulness against the aged knight, a serious charge, for he was the very pink of chivalry. She says, According to the data given, the time at the summit affords no clue to the total distance. It does not enable us to state precisely to an inch how much level and how much hill there was on the road. Fair damsel, the aged knight replies, if, as I surmise, thy initials denote early womanhood, bethink thee that the word enable is thine, not mine. I did but ask the time of reaching the hilltop as my condition for further parley. If now thou wilt not grant that I am a truth-loving man, then will I affirm that those same initials denote evenomed wickedness. Class list. First, a Marlborough boy, Putney Walker. Second, Blythe, E. W., L. B., O. V. L., Rose, Seabreeze, Simple Susan, and Money Spinner. Blythe has made so ingenious an addition to the problem, and Simple Susan and Co. have solved it in such tuneful verse that I record both their answers in full. I have altered a word or two in Blythe's, which I trust she will excuse. It did not seem quite as clear as it stood. Yet stay, said the youth, as a gleam of inspiration lighted up the relaxing muscles of his quiescent features. Stay. Methinks it matters little when we reach that summit, the crown of our toil. For in the space of time wherein we clambered up one mile and bounded down the same on our return, we could have trudged the twain on the level. We have plodded, then, four and twenty miles in these six mortal hours, for never a moment did we stop for catching a fleeting breath or for gazing on the scene around. Very good, said the old man, twelve miles out and twelve miles in, and we reached the top some time between six and seven of the clock. Now mark me. For every five minutes that had fled since six of the clock when we stood on yonder peak, so many miles had we toiled upwards on the dreary mountain side. The youth moaned and rushed into the hostel. Blythe. The elder and the younger knight, they sallied forth at three. How far they went on level ground, it matters not to me. What time they reached the foot of hill when they began to mount are problems which I hold to be of very small account. 
the moment that each waved his hat upon the topmost peak to trivial queries such as this no answer will i seek yet can i tell the distance well they must have travelled o'er on hill and plain twixt three and nine the miles were twenty-four four miles an hour their steady pace along the level track three when they climbed but six when they came swiftly striding back adown the hill and little skill it needs methinks to show up hill and down together told four miles an hour they go for whether long or short the time upon the hill they spent two-thirds were passed in going up one-third in the descent two-thirds at three one-third at six if rightly reckoned o'er will make one hole at four the tale is tangled now no more simple susan money spinner end of chapter eleven of a tangled tale this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in october two thousand and nine a tangled tale by lewis carroll chapter twelve answers to not two paragraph one the dinner party problem the governor of kugovchny wants to give a very small dinner party and invites his father's brother-in-law his brother's father-in-law his father-in-law's brother and his brother-in-law's father find the number of guests answer one in this genealogy males are denoted by capitals and females by small letters the governor is capital e and his guest is capital c ten answers have been received of these one is wrong galanthus nivalis major who insists on inviting two guests one being the governor's wife's brother's father if she had taken his sister's husband's father instead she would have found it possible to reduce the guests to one of the nine who send right answers sea breeze is the very faintest breath that ever bore the name she simply states that the governor's uncle might fulfil all the conditions by intermarriages wind of the western sea you have had a very narrow escape be thankful to appear in the class list at all Bog Oak and Bradshaw of the future use genealogies which require sixteen people instead of fourteen by inviting the governor's father's sister's husband instead of his father's wife's brother. I cannot think this so good a solution as one that requires only fourteen. Caius and Valentine deserve special mention as the only two who have supplied genealogies. Class list. First. B. Caius, M. M. Mathematics, Old Cat, Valentine. Second, Bog Oak, Bradshaw of the Future. Third, Sea Breeze. Paragraph 2. The Lodgings. Problem. A square has twenty doors on each side, which contains twenty-one equal parts. They are numbered all round, beginning at one corner from which of the four numbers nine twenty five fifty two seventy three is the sum of the distance to the other three least answer from number nine let a be number nine b number twenty five c number fifty two and d number seventy three then a b equals the square root of the quantity twelve squared plus five squared equals the square root of 169 equals 13 ac equals 21 ad equals the square root of the quantity 9 squared plus 8 squared equals the square root of 145 equals 12 plus nota bene that is between 12 and 13 bc equals the square root of the quantity sixteen squared plus twelve squared equals the square root of four hundred equals twenty bd equals the square root of the quantity three squared plus twenty one squared 
equals the square root of 450 equals 21 plus cd equals the square root of the quantity 9 squared plus 13 squared equals the square root of 250 equals 15 plus hence sum of distances from a is between 46 and 47 from b between 54 and 55 from c between 56 and 57 from d between 48 and 51 why not between 48 and 49 make this out for yourselves hence the sum is least for a 25 solutions have been received of these 15 must be marked zero five are partly right and five right of the 15 i may dismiss alphabetical phantom bog oak dynamite fifi Galanthus nivalis major i fear the cold spring has blighted our snowdrop guy hms pinafore janet and valentine with the simple remark that they insist on the unfortunate lodgers keeping to the pavement i use the words crossed to number seventy three for the special purpose of showing that shortcuts were possible sea breeze does the same and adds that the result would be the same even if they crossed the square but gives no proof of this m m draws a diagram and says that number nine is the house as the diagram shows i cannot see how it does so old cat assumes that the house must be number nine or number seventy three she does not explain how she estimates the distances b s arithmetic is faulty she makes the square root of one hundred sixty nine plus the square root of four hundred forty two plus the square root of one hundred and thirty equal seven hundred forty one i suppose you mean the square root of seven hundred forty one which would be a little nearer the truth but roots cannot be added in this manner do you think square root of nine plus square root of sixteen is twenty five or even square root of twenty five but iris state is more perilous still she draws illogical conclusions with a frightful calmness after pointing out rightly that a c is less than b d she says therefore the nearest house to the other three must be a or c and again after pointing out rightly that b and d are both within the half square containing a she says therefore a b plus a d must be less than b c plus c d there is no logical force in either therefore for the first try numbers one twenty one sixty seventy this will make your premise true and your conclusion false similarly for the second try numbers one thirty fifty one seventy one of the five partly right solutions rags and tatters and mad hatter who send one answer between them make number twenty five six units from the corner instead of five cheem e r d l and maggie potts leave openings at the corners of the square which are not in the data moreover cheem gives values for the distances without any hint that they are only approximations crophi and mophi make the bold and unfounded assumption that there were really twenty-one houses on each side instead of twenty as stated by balbus we may assume they add that the doors of numbers twenty one forty two sixty three eighty four are invisible from the centre of the square what is it there i wonder that crophi and mophi would not assume of the five who are wholly right i think bradshaw of the future caius clifton c and Martreb deserve special praise for the full analytical solutions mathematics picks out number nine and proves it to be the right house in two ways very neatly and ingenuously but why he picks it out does not appear it is an excellent synthetical proof but lacks the analysis which the other four supply class list first bradshaw of the future caius clifton c martrap second mathematics third cheem crophi and mophi e r d l maggie potts rags and tatters and mad hatter 
A remonstrance has reached me from Scrutator on the subject of not one, which he declares was no problem at all. Two questions, he says, are put. To solve one, there is no data, the other answers itself. As to the first point, Scrutator is mistaken. There are, not ease, data sufficient to answer the question. As to the other, it is interesting to know that the question answers itself and I am sure it does the question great credit. Still, I fear I cannot enter it on the list of winners, as this competition is only open to human beings. End of chapter 12Recording by Avayi in October 2009 A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll Chapter 13 Answers to Not 3 Problem 1. Two travellers, starting at the same time, went opposite ways round a circular railway. Trains start each way every 15 minutes, the easterly ones going round in three hours, the westerly in two. How many trains did each meet on the way, not counting trains met at the terminus itself? 2. They went round as before, each traveller counting as 1 the train containing the other traveller. How many did each meet? Answers. 1. 19. 2. The easterly traveller met 12, the other 8. The trains one way took 180 minutes, the other way 120. Let us take the least common multiple, 360, and divide the railway into 360 units. Then one set of trains went at the rate of 2 units a minute and at intervals of 30 units, the other at the rate of 3 units a minute and at intervals of 45 units. An easterly train starting has 45 units between it and the first train it will meet. It does two-fifths of this, while the other does three-fifths, and thus meets it at the end of 18 units, and so all the way round. A westerly train starting has 30 units between it and the first train it will meet. It does three-fifths of this, while the other does two-fifths and thus meets it at the end of 18 units, and so all the way round. Hence, if the railway be divided by 19 posts into 20 parts, each containing 18 units, trains meet at every post, and, in one, each traveller passes 19 posts in going round, and so meets 19 trains. But, in two, the easterly traveller only begins to count after traversing two-fifths of the journey, that is, on reaching the eighth post, and so counts twelve posts. Similarly, the other counts eight. They meet at the end of two-fifths of three hours, or three-fifths of two hours, that is, seventy-two minutes. Forty-five answers have been received. Of these, twelve are beyond the reach of discussion, as they give no working. I can but enumerate their names. Ardmore, E. A., F. A. D., L. D., Mathematics, M. E. T., Poo Poo, and The Red Queen are all wrong. Beta and Rowena have got one right and two wrong. Cheeky Bob and Nairam give the right answers, but it may perhaps make the one less cheeky and induce the other to take a less inverted view of things to be informed that, if this had been a competition for a prize, they would have got no marks. Nota bene, I have not ventured to put EA's name in full, as she only gave it provisionally in case her answer should prove right. Of the 33 answers for which the working is given, 10 are wrong, 11 half wrong and half right, 3 right, except that they cherished the delusion that it was Clara who travelled in the easterly train, a point which the data do not enable us to settle, and 9 wholly right. The 10 wrong answers are from Boo Peep, Financier, IWT, Kate B, MAH, QYZ, Seagull, Thistledown, Tom Quad, and an unsigned one. 
Boopeep rightly says that the easterly traveller met all trains which started during the three hours of her trip, as well as all which started during the previous two hours, that is, all which started at the commencements of twenty periods of fifteen minutes each, and she is right in striking out the one she met at the moment of starting, but wrong in striking out the last train, for she did not meet this at the terminus, but fifteen minutes before she got there. She makes the same mistake in two. Financier thinks that any train met for the second time is not to be counted. IWT finds, by a process which is not stated, that the travellers met at the end of 71 minutes and 26 and a half seconds. Kate B. thinks the trains which are met on starting and on arriving are never to be counted, even when met elsewhere. QYZ tries a rather complex algebraical solution and succeeds in finding the time of meeting correctly. All else is wrong. Seagull seems to think that, in one, the easterly train stood still for three hours, and says that, in two, the travellers met at the end of 71 minutes 40 seconds. Thistledown nobly confesses to having tried no calculation, but merely having drawn a picture of the railway and counted the trains. In one, she counts wrong. In two, she makes them meet in 75 minutes. Tom Quad omits one. In two, he makes Clara count the train she met on her arrival. The unsigned one is also unintelligible. It states that the travellers go one twenty-fourth more than the total distance to be traversed. The Clara theory, already referred to, is adopted by five of these, that is, Boopeep, Financier, Kate B., Tom Quad, and the nameless writer. The eleven half-right answers are from Bog Oak, Bridget, Castor, Cheshire Cat, G. E. B., Guy, Mary, M. A. H., Old Maid, R. W., and Vendredi. All these adopt the Clara theory. Castor omits one. Vendredi gets one right, but in two makes the same mistake as Boo Peep. I notice in your solution a marvelous proportion sum. Three hundred miles to two hours proportional to one mile to twenty-four seconds. May I venture to advise your acquiring as soon as possible an utter disbelief in the possibility of a ratio existing between miles and hours? Do not be disheartened by your two friends' sarcastic remarks on your roundabout ways. Their short method of adding twelve and eight has the slight disadvantage of bringing the answer wrong. Even a roundabout method is better than that. M.A.H. in 2 makes the travellers count 1 after they met, not when they met. Cheshire Cat and Old Maid get 20 as answer for 1, by forgetting to strike out the train met on arrival. The others all get 18 in various ways. Bog Oak, Guy and R.W. divide the trains which the westerly traveller has to meet into two sets, that is, those already on the line, which they rightly make eleven, and those which started during her two hours' journey, exclusive of train met on arrival, which they wrongly make seven, and they make a similar mistake with the easterly train. Bridget, rightly, says that the westerly traveller met a train every six minutes for two hours, but wrongly makes the number twenty. It should be twenty-one. G.E.B. adopts Boo Peep's method, but wrongly strikes out, for the easterly traveller, the train which started at the commencement of the previous two hours. Mary thinks a train met on arrival must not be counted, even when met on a previous occasion. The three who are wholly right, but for the unfortunate Clara theory, are F. Lee, G.S.C. and X.A.B. And now descend, ye classic ten, who have solved the whole problem. Your names are Aylebain, Algernon Bray, thanks for a friendly remark, which comes with a hard warmth that not even the Atlantic could chill. Arvon, Bradshaw of the Future, Fifi, H.L.R., J.L.O., Omega, S.S.G., and Waiting for the Train. Several of these have put Clara provisionally into the easterly train, but they seem to have understood that the data do not decide that point. 
Class list. First. Aile Bain. Algernon Bray. Bradshaw of the Future. Fifi. HLR. Omega. SSG. Waiting for the train. Second. Arvan. JLO. Third. F. Lee. GSC. XAB. End of chapter 13. Fourteen of A Tangled Tale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hawaii in October 2009. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll. Chapter 14. Answers to Not Four. Problem. There are five sacks, of which numbers one, two weigh twelve pounds, numbers two, three, thirteen and a half pounds, numbers three, four, eleven and a half pounds, numbers four, five, eight pounds, numbers one, three, five, sixteen pounds, required the weight of each sack. Answer. Five and a half, six and a half, seven four and a half three and a half the sum of all the weighings sixty one pounds includes sack number three thrice and each other twice deducting twice the sum of the first and fourth weighings we get twenty one pounds for thrice number three that is seven pounds for number three Hence, the second and third weighings give six and a half pounds, four and a half pounds for numbers two, four, and hence again the first and fourth weighings give five and a half pounds, three and a half pounds for numbers one, five. Ninety seven answers have been received. Of these, fifteen are beyond the reach of discussion, as they give no working. I can but enumerate their names, and I take this opportunity of saying that this is the last time I shall put on record the names of competitors who give no sort of clue to the process by which their answers were obtained. In guessing a conundrum, or in catching a flea, we do not expect a breathless victor to give us afterwards, in cold blood, a history of the mental or muscular efforts by which he achieved success but a mathematical calculation is another thing the names of these mute inglorious band are common sense d e r douglas e l ellen i m t j m c joseph not one lucy meek m f c pyramus shah veritas of the eighty-two answers with which the working or some approach to it is supplied one is wrong seventeen have given solutions which are from one cause or another practically valueless the remaining sixty-four i shall try to arrange in a class list according to the varying degrees of shortness and neatness to which they seem to have attained the solitary wrong answer is from nell to be thus alone in the crowd is a distinction a painful one no doubt but still a distinction I am sorry for you, my dear young lady, and I seem to hear your tearful exclamation when you read these lines. Ah, this is the knell of all my hopes. Why, oh why, did you assume that the fourth and fifth bags weighed four pounds each? And why did you not test your answers? However, please try again, and please don't change your nom de plume. Let us have knell in the first class next time. The seventeen whose solutions are practically valueless are Ardmore, a ready reckoner, Arthur, Bog Lark, Bog Oak, Bridget, first attempt, J. L. C., M. E. T., Rose, Rovina, Seabreeze, Sylvia, Thistledown, three fifths asleep, Vendredi, and Winifred. Bog Lark tries it by a sort of rule of false assuming experimentally that numbers one two weigh six pounds each and having thus produced seventeen and a half instead of sixteen as the weight of one three and five she removes the superfluous pound and a half but does not explain how she knows from which to take it three-fifths asleep says that when in that peculiar state it seems perfectly clear to her that 
three out of the five sacks being weighed twice over, two-fifths of forty-five equals twenty-seven, must be the total weight of the five sacks. As to which I can only say with the captain, it beats me entirely. Winifred, on the plea that one must have a starting point, assumes, what I fear is a mere guess, that number one weighed five and a half pounds. The rest all do it, wholly or partly, by guesswork. The problem is, of course, as any algebraist sees at once, a case of simultaneous simple equations. It is, however, easily soluble by arithmetic only, and when this is the case, I hold that it is bad workmanship to use the more complex method. I have not, this time, given more credit to arithmetical solutions, but in future problems I shall, other things being equal, give the highest marks to those who use the simplest machinery. I have put into class 1 those whose answers seemed specially short and neat, and into class 3 those that seemed specially long or clumsy. Of this last set, ACM, Fursbush, James, Partridge, RW, and waiting for the train have sent long wandering solutions, the substitutions having no definite method, but seeming to have been made to see what would come of it. Chilpome and Dublin boy omit some of the working. Arvon Marlborough boy only finds the weight of one sack. Class list. First. B. E. D. C. H. Constance Johnson. Greystead. Guy. Hupo. J. F. A. M. A. H. Number 5. Pedro. R. E. X. Seven old men. Vis Inertiae. Willie B. Yahoo. Second, American subscriber, an appreciative schoolman, Ayer, Bradshaw of the Future, Cheem, CMG, Dynamite, Duckwing, ECM, E.N. Lowry, Ira, Euroclydon, FHW, Fifi, GEB, Harlequin, Hawthorne, Hugh Green, JAB, Jack Tarr, J.B.B. Kukovjny. Landlubber. L.D. Magpie. Mary. Mruxi. Mini. Money Spinner. Nairam. Old Cat. Polychinelle. Simple Susan. S.S.G. Thisp. Verena. Wamba. Wolf. Wycamicus. Y.M.A.H. Third. A.C.M. Arvon Marlborough Boy, Chilpome, Dublin Boy, Fursbush, James, Partridge, R.W., Waiting for the Train. End of chapter 1415 of A Tangled Tale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaii in October 2009 A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll Chapter 15 Answers to Knot 5 Problem To mark pictures, giving three crosses to two or three, two to four or five, and one to nine or ten, also giving three odds to one or two, two to three or four, and one to eight or nine, so as to mark the smallest possible number of pictures, and to give them the largest possible number of marks. Answer. Ten pictures, twenty-nine marks. Arranged thus in a three by ten matrix. The first row has crosses in the first nine columns, and an odd in the tenth column. The second row has crosses in the first five columns, an empty entry in the sixth column, and odds in columns 7 to 10. The third row has crosses in the first two columns, and odds in the last eight columns. Solution. By giving all the crosses possible, putting into brackets the optional ones, we get 10 pictures marked thus in a 3 by 10 matrix. The first row has crosses in all columns, the cross in the last column is put in brackets. The second row has crosses in the first five columns. The last cross is put in brackets. 
and the columns 6 to 10 are empty. The third row has crosses in the first three columns, the last cross is put in brackets, and the columns 4 to 10 are empty. By then assigning odds in the same way, beginning at the other end, we get nine pictures marked thus in a 3 by 9 matrix. The first row starts with seven empty columns, has an odd put in brackets in the eighth column, and an odd in the ninth column. The second row starts with five empty columns, has an odd put in brackets in the sixth column, and odds in columns seven to nine. The third row has nine odds, the odd in the first column is put in brackets. All we have now to do is to run these two wedges as close together as they will go, so as to get the minimum number of pictures erasing optional marks where by so doing we can run them closer, but otherwise letting them stand. There are ten necessary marks in the first row and in the third, but only seven in the second. Hence we erase all optional marks in the first and third rows, but let them stand in the second. Twenty-two answers have been received. Of these, eleven give no working, so, in accordance with what I announced in my last review of answers, I leave them unnamed, merely mentioning that five are right and six wrong. Of the eleven answers with which some working is supplied, three are wrong. CH begins with the rash assertion that under the given conditions the sum is impossible, for he or she adds, these initial correspondents are dismally vague beings to deal with, perhaps it would be a better pronoun. Ten is the least possible number of pictures. Granted. Therefore we must either give two crosses to six, or two odds to five. Why must, O oh alphabetical phantom? It is nowhere ordained that every picture must have three marks. Fifi sends a folio page of solution, which deserved a better fate. She offers three answers, in each of which ten pictures are marked, with thirty marks. In one she gives two crosses to six pictures, in another to seven, in the third she gives two odds to five, thus in every case ignoring the conditions. I pause to remark that the condition two crosses to four or five pictures can only mean either to four or else to five. If, as one competitor holds, it might mean any number not less than four, the words or five would be superfluous. IEA, I am happy to say that none of these bloodless phantoms appear this time in the class list. Is it idea with a D left out? Gives two crosses to six pictures. She then takes me to task for using the word ought instead of not. No doubt, to one who thus rebels against the rules laid down for her guidance, the word must be distasteful. But does not IEA remember the parallel case of adder? That creature was originally a nadder. Then the two words took to bandying the poor N backwards and forwards like a shuttlecock, the final state of the game being an adder. May not a naught have similar become an ought? Anyhow, Odds and crosses is a very old game. I don't think I ever heard it called knots and crosses. In the following class list, I hope the solitary occupant of three will sheath her claws when she hears how narrow an escape she has had of not being named at all. Her account of the process by which she got the answer is so meagre that, like the nursery tale of Jack a Minery, I trust IEA will be merciful to the spelling, it is scarcely to be distinguished from zero. Class list. First. Guy, old cat, sea breeze. Second. Ayer, Bradshaw of the future, F. Lee, H. Vernon. Third. Cat. End of chapter 15. Sixteen of A Tangled Tale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaii in October 2009. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll. Chapter 16. Answers to Not Six. Problem 1. A and B began the year with only £1,000 apiece. They borrowed not, they stole not. On the next New Year's Day, they had £60,000 between them. 
How did they do it? Solution. They went that day to the Bank of England. A stood in front of it, while B went round and stood behind it. Two answers have been received, both worthy of much honour. Edelpate makes them borrow zero and steal zero, and uses both ciphers by putting them at the right-hand end of the one thousand pounds, thus producing one hundred thousand pounds, which is well over the mark. But, or to express it in Latin, Atspes Infracta has solved it even more ingenuously. With the first cipher she turns the one of the one thousand pounds into a nine, and adds the results to the original sum, thus getting ten thousand pounds. And in this, by means of the other zero, she turns the one into a six, thus hitting the exact sixty thousand pounds. Class list. First, Atspes Infracta. Second, Adelpate. Problem two. L makes five scarves, while M makes two. Z makes four, while L makes three. Five scarves of Z's weigh one of L's. Five of M's weigh three of Z's. One of M's is as warm as four of Z's, and one of L's as warm as three of M's. Which is best, giving equal weight in the result to rapidity of work, lightness, and warmth? Answer. The order is M, L, Z. Solution. As to rapidity, other things being constant, L's merit is to M's in the ratio of 5 to 2, Z's to L's in the ratio of 4 to 3. In order to get one set of three numbers fulfilling these conditions, it is perhaps simplest to take the one that occurs twice as unity and reduce the others to fractions. This gives, for L, M, and Z, the marks 1, 2 fifths, 2 thirds. In estimating for lightness, we observe that the greater the weight, the less the merit, so that Z's merit is to L's as 5 to 1. Thus the marks for lightness are 1 fifth, 2 thirds, 1. And similarly, the marks for warmth are 3, 1, 1 fourth. To get the total result, we must multiply L's three marks together and do the same for M and for Z. The final numbers are 1 times 1 fifth times 3, 2 fifths times 2 thirds times 1, 2 thirds times 1 times 1 quarter, that is, 3 fifths, 2 thirds, 1 third, that is, multiplying throughout by 15, which will not alter the proportion, 9, 10, 5, showing the order of merit to be M, L, Z. 29 answers have been received, of which 5 are right and 24 wrong. These hapless ones have all, with three exceptions, fallen into the error of adding the proportional numbers together for each candidate instead of multiplying. Why the latter is right rather than the former is fully proved in textbooks, so I will not occupy space by stating it here. But it can be illustrated very easily by the case of length, breadth, and depth. Suppose A and B are rival diggers of rectangular tanks. The amount of work done is evidently measured by the number of cubical feet dug out. Let A dig a tank, 10 feet long, 10 wide, 2 deep. Let B dig one, six feet long, five wide, ten deep. The cubical contents are two hundred, three hundred, that is, B is best digger in the ratio of three to two. Now try marking for length, width, and depth separately, giving a maximum mark of ten to the best in each contest, and then adding the results. Of the twenty-four malefactors, one gives no working, and so has no real claim to be named, but I break the rule for once, in deference to its success in problem one. He, she, or it is Edelpate. The other twenty-three may be divided into five groups. First and worst are, I take it, those who put the rightful winner last, arranging them as Lolo, Zuzu, Mimi. The names of these desperate wrongdoers are Ayr, Bradshaw of the Future, Furzbush, and Pollux, who send a joint answer, Greystead, Guy, Old Hen, and Simple Susan. 
the latter was once best of all the old hen has taken advantage of her simplicity and beguiled her with the chaff which was the bane of her own chickenhood secondly i point the finger of scorn at those who have put the worst candidate at the top arranging them as zuzu mimi lolo they are grecia m m old cat and r e x tis grease but the third set have avoided both these enormities and have even succeeded in putting the worst last their answer being lolo mimi zuzu their names are ayer who also appears among the quite tutu clifton c f b fifi grig janet and mrs Sari gamp f b has not fallen into the common error she multiplies together the proportionate numbers she gets but in getting them she goes wrong by reckoning warmth as a demerit possibly she is freshly burnt or comes from bombay janet and miss Sari gamp have also avoided this error the method they have adopted is shrouded in mystery i scarcely feel competent to criticize it mrs gamp says if zuzu makes four while lola makes three zuzu makes six while lola makes five bad reasoning while mimi makes two from this she concludes therefore zuzu excels in speed by one that is when compared with lolo but what about mimi she then compares the three kinds of excellence measured on this mystic scale janet takes the statement that lolo makes five while mimi makes two to prove that lolo makes three while mimi makes one and zuzu four worse reasoning than mrs gamp's and thence concludes that zuzu excels in speed by one-eighth janet should have been adeline mystery of mysteries the fourth set actually put mimi at the top arranging them as mimi zuzu lolo they are marquis and co martrap s b b first initial scarcely legible may be meant for j and stanza the fifth set consists of an ancient fish and camel these ill-assorted comrades by dint of foot and fin have scrambled into the right answer but as their method is wrong of course it counts for nothing also an ancient fish has very ancient and fish-like ideas as to how numbers represent merit she says lolo gains two and a half on mimi two and a half what fish fish art thou in thy duty of the five winners i put balbus and the elder traveller slightly below the other three balbus for defective reasoning the other for scanty working balbus gives two reasons for saying that addition of marks is not the right method and then adds it follows that the decision must be made by multiplying the marks together this is hardly more logical than to say this is not spring therefore it must be autumn class list first dynamite e b d l joram second balbus the elder traveller with regard to knot five i beg to express to vis inertiae and to any others who like her understood the condition to be that every marked picture must have three marks my sincere regret that the unfortunate phrase fill the columns with odds and crosses should have caused them to waste so much time and trouble i can only repeat that a literal interpretation of fill would seem to me to require that every picture in the gallery should be marked vis inertiae would have been in the first class if she had sent in the solution she now offers End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of a tangled tale this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by Abayi in october two thousand and nine a tangled tale by lewis carroll chapter seventeen answers to knot seven problem given that one glass of lemonade three sandwiches and seven biscuits cost one and two pence and that one glass of lemonade four sandwiches and ten biscuits cost one and five pence find the cost of one a glass of lemonade a sandwich and a biscuit and two two glasses of lemonade three sandwiches and five biscuits answer one eight pence two one and seven pence solution 
this is best treated algebraically let x equal the cost in pence of a glass of lemonade y of a sandwich and z of a biscuit then we have x plus three y plus seven z equals fourteen and x plus four y plus ten z equals seventeen and we require the values of x plus y plus z and of two x plus three y plus five z now from two equations only we cannot find separately the values of three unknowns certain combinations of them may however be found also we know that we can by the help of the given equations eliminate two of the three unknowns from the quantity whose value is required which will then contain one only if then the required value is ascertainable at all it can only be by the third unknown vanishing of itself otherwise the problem is impossible let us then eliminate lemonade and sandwiches and reduce everything to biscuits a state of things even more depressing than if all the world were apple pie by subtracting the first equation from the second which eliminates lemonade and gives y plus three z equals three or y equals three minus three z and then substituting this value of y in the first which gives x minus two z equals five that is x equals five plus two z now if we substitute these values of x y in the quantities whose values are required the first becomes the quantity five plus two z plus the quantity three minus three z plus z that is eight and the second becomes two times the quantity five plus two z plus three times the quantity three minus three z plus five z that is nineteen hence the answers are one eight pence two one and seven pence the above is a universal method that is it is absolutely certain either to produce the answer or to prove that no answer is possible the question may also be solved by combining the quantities whose values are given so as to form those whose values are required this is merely a matter of ingenuity and good luck and as it may fail even when the thing is possible and is of no use in proving it impossible i cannot rank this method as equal in value with the other even when it succeeds it may prove a very tedious process suppose the twenty-six competitors who have sent in what i may call accidental solutions had had a question to deal with where every number contained eight or ten digits i suspect it would have been a case of silver is the raven hair see patience before any solution would have been hit on by the most ingenious of them forty-five answers have come in of which forty-four give i am happy to say some sort of working and therefore deserve to be mentioned by name and to have their virtues or vices as the case may be discussed thirteen have made assumptions to which they have no right and so cannot figure in the class list even though in ten of the thirteen cases the answer is right of the remaining twenty-eight no less than twenty-six have sent in accidental solutions and therefore fall short of the highest honours i will now discuss individual cases taking the worst first as my custom is froggy gives no working at least this is all he gives after stating the given equations he says therefore the difference one sandwich plus three biscuits equals three pence then follow the amounts of the unknown bills with no further hint as to how he got them froggy has had a very narrow escape of not being named at all of those who are wrong vis inertiae has sent in a piece of incorrect working peruse the horrid details and shudder she takes x call it y as the cost of a sandwich and concludes rightly enough that a biscuit will cost the quantity three minus y over three she then subtracts the second equation from the first and deduces three y plus seven times the quantity three minus y over three minus four y plus ten times the quantity three minus y divided by three equals three by making two mistakes in this line she brings out y equals two over two try it again o vis inertiae 
away with inertia infuse a little more vis and you will bring out the correct though uninteresting result zero equals zero this will show you that it is hopeless to try to coax any one of these three unknowns to reveal its separate value the other competitor who is wrong throughout is either j m c or t m c but whether he be a juvenile miscalculator or a true mathematician confused he makes the answers seven pence and one and five pence he assumes with too much confidence that biscuits were half a penny each and that clara paid for eight though she only ate seven we will now consider the thirteen whose working is wrong though the answer is right and not to measure their demerits too exactly i will take them in alphabetical order anita finds rightly that one sandwich and three biscuits cost three pence and proceeds therefore one sandwich equals one and a half pence three biscuits equals one and a half pence one lemonade equals six pence dynamite begins like anita and thence proves rightly that a biscuit costs less than a penny whence she concludes wrongly that it must cost half a penny f c w is so beautifully resigned to the certainty of a verdict of guilty that i have hardly the heart to utter the word without adding a recommended to mercy owing to extenuating circumstances but really you know where are the extenuating circumstances she begins by assuming that lemonade is four pence a glass and sandwiches three pence each making with the two given equations four conditions to be fulfilled by three miserable unknowns and having naturally developed this into a contradiction she then tries five pence and two pence with a similar result nota bene this process might have been carried on through the whole of the tertiary period without gratifying one single megatherium she then by a happy thought tries half-penny biscuits and so obtains a consistent result this may be a good solution viewing the problem as a conundrum but it is not scientific janet identifies sandwiches with biscuits one sandwich plus three biscuits she makes equal to four for what mayfair makes the astounding assertion that the equation s plus three b equals three is evidently only satisfied by s equals two halves b equals one half old cat believes that the assumption that a sandwich costs one and a half pence is the only way to avoid unmanageable fractions but why avoid them is there not a certain glow of triumph in taming such a fraction ladies and gentlemen the fraction now before you is one that for years defied all efforts of a refining nature it was in a word hopelessly vulgar treating it as a circulating decimal the treadmill of fractions only made matters worse as a last resource i reduced it to its lowest terms and extracted its square root joking apart let me thank old cat for some very kind words of sympathy in reference to a correspondent whose name i am happy to say i have now forgotten who had found fault with me as a discourteous critic o v l is beyond my comprehension he takes the given equations as one and two thence by the process two minus one deduces rightly equation three that is s plus three b equals three and thence again by the process times three a hopeless mystery deduces three s plus four b equals four i have nothing to say about it i give it up sea breeze says it is immaterial to the answer why in what proportion three pence is divided between the sandwich and the three biscuits so she assumes s equals one and a half pence b equals half a penny stanza is one of a very irregular metre at first she like janet identifies sandwiches with biscuits she then tries two assumptions s equals one b equals two-thirds and s equals one-half b equals two-sixths and naturally ends in contradictions then she returns to the first assumption and finds the three unknowns separately quod est absurdum stiletto identifies sandwiches and biscuits as articles 
Is the word ever used by confectioners? I fancied, what is the next article, ma'am, was limited to linen drapers. Two sisters first assume that biscuits are for a penny, and then that there are two a penny, adding that the answer will of course be the same in both cases. It is a dreamy remark, making one feel something like Macbeth, grasping at the spectral dagger. Is this a statement that I see before me? If you were to say, we both walked the same way this morning, and I were to say, one of you walked the same way, but the other didn't, which of the three would be the most hopelessly confused? Turtle Piet, what is a Turtle Piet, please? And Old Crow, who sent a joint answer, and YY adopt the same method. YY gets the equation S plus 3B equals 3, and then says, this sum must be apportioned in one of the three following ways. It may be, I grant you, but why why do you say must? I fear it is possible for why why to be too wise. The other two conspirators are less positive. They say it can be so divided, but they add either of the three prices being right. This is bad grammar and bad arithmetic at once, O oh mysterious birds. Of those who win honours, the Shetland snark must have the third class all to himself. He has only answered half the question, that is, the amount of Clara's luncheon, the two little old ladies he pitilessly leaves in the midst of their difficulty. I beg to assure him, with thanks for his friendly remarks, that entrance fees and subscriptions are things unknown in that most economical of clubs, the knot untires. The authors of the twenty-six accidental solutions differ only in the number of steps they have taken between the data and the answers. In order to do them full justice, I have arranged a second class in sections, according to the number of steps. The two kings are fearfully deliberate. I suppose walking quick or taking shortcuts is inconsistent with kingly dignity. But really, in reading Thesea's solution, one almost fancied he was marking time and making no advance at all. The other king will, I hope, pardon me for having altered coal into coal. King Coilus, or Coil, seems to have reigned soon after Arthur's time. Henry of Huntington identifies him with the King Coel, who first built walls round Colster, which was named after him. In the Chronicle of Robert of Gloucester we read, After King Irirag, of one we have ye told, Marius his son was king, quaint mon and bold, and his son was after him, Coil was his name, both it were quaint men and of noble fame. Balbus lays it down as a general principle that, in order to ascertain the cost of any one luncheon, it must come to the same amount upon two different assumptions. Query, should not it be we? Otherwise the luncheon is represented as wishing to ascertain its own cost. He then makes two assumptions. One, that sandwiches cost nothing, the other, that biscuits cost nothing. Either arrangement would lead to the shop being inconveniently crowded, and brings out the unknown luncheons as eight pence and nineteen pence on each assumption. He then concludes that this agreement of results shows that the answers are correct. Now I propose to disprove his general law by simply giving one instance of its failing. One instance is quite enough. In logical language, in order to disprove a universal affirmative, it is enough to prove its contradictory, which is a particular negative. I must pause for a digression on logic, and especially on ladies' logic. The universal affirmative, everybody says he's a duck, is crushed instantly by proving the particular negative, Peter says he's a goose, which is equivalent to Peter does not say he's a duck and the universal negative, nobody calls on her, is well met by the particular affirmative, I called yesterday. In short, either of two contradictories disproves the other, and the moral is that, since a particular proposition is much more easily proved than a universal one, it is the wisest course in arguing with a lady to limit one's own assertions to particulars, and leave her to prove the universal contradictory, if she can. You will thus generally secure a logical victory, 
a practical victory is not to be hoped for since she can always fall back upon the crushing remark that has nothing to do with it a move for which man has not yet discovered any satisfactory answer now let us return to balbus here is my particular negative on which to test his rule suppose the two recorded luncheons to have been two buns one queen cake two sausage rolls and a bottle of zoedon total one and nine pence and one bun two queen cakes a sausage roll and a bottle of zoedon total one and four pence and suppose clara's unknown luncheon to have been three buns one queen cake one sausage roll and two bottles of zoedon while the two little sisters had been indulging in eight buns four queen cakes two sausage rolls and six bottles of zoedon poor souls how thirsty they must have been if balbus will kindly try this by his principle of two assumptions first assuming that a bun is one penny and a queen cake two pence and then that a bun is three pence and a queen cake three pence he will bring out the other two luncheons on each assumption as one and nine pence and four and ten pence respectively which harmony of results he will say shows that the answers are correct and yet as a matter of fact the buns were two pence each the queen cakes three pence the sausage rolls six pence and the zoedon two pence a bottle so that clara's third luncheon had cost one and seven pence and her thirsty friends had spent four and four pence another remark of balbus i will quote and discuss for i think that it also may yield a moral for some of my readers he says it is the same thing in substance whether in solving this problem we use words and call it arithmetic or use letters and signs and call it algebra now this does not appear to me a correct description of the two methods the arithmetical method is that of synthesis only it goes from one known fact to another till it reaches its goal whereas the algebraical method is that of analysis it begins with the goal symbolically represented and so goes backwards dragging its veiled victim with it till it has reached the full daylight of known facts in which it can tear off the veil and say i know you take an illustration your house has been broken into and robbed and you appeal to the policeman who was on duty that night well mum i did see a chap getting out over your garden wall but i was a good bit off so i didn't chase him like i just cut down the short way to the checkers and who should i meet but bill sykes coming full split round the corner so i just ups and says my lad you're wanted that's all i says and he says i'll go along quiet bobby he says without the darbies he says there's your arithmetical policeman now try the other method i seed somebody a-running but he was well gone or ever i got nigh the place so i just took a look round in the garden and i noticed the footmarks where the chap had come right across your flower beds there was good big footmarks surely and i noticed as the left foot went down at the heel ever so much deeper than the other and i says to myself the chap's been a big hulking chap and he goes lame on his left foot and i rubs my hand on the wall where he got over and there was soot on it and no mistake so i says to myself now where can i light on a big man in the chimbley sweep line what's lame of one foot and i flashes up promiscuous and i says it's bill sykes says i there is your algebraical policeman a higher intellectual type to my thinking than the other little jack's solution calls for a word of praise as he has written out what really is an algebraical proof in words without representing any of his facts as equations if it is all his own he will make a good algebraist in the time to come i beg to thank simple susan for some kind words of sympathy to the same effect as those received from old cat hecla and martrab are the only two who have used the method certain either to produce the answer or else to prove it impossible so they must share between them the highest honors class list first hecla martrab second paragraph one two steps adelaide clifton c e k c guy l'inconnu little jack nil desperandum simple susan yellow hammer woolly one paragraph two three steps 
A. A. A Christmas Carol. Afternoon Tea. An Appreciative School Ma'am. Baby. Balbus. Bog Oak. The Red Queen. Wallflower. Paragraph 3. Four Steps. Hawthorne. Joram. S. S. G. Paragraph 4. Five Steps. A Stepney Coach. Paragraph 5. Six Steps. Bay Laurel. Bradshaw of the Future. Paragraph 6. Nine Steps. Old King Cole. Paragraph 7. Fourteen Steps. Theseus. Answers to Correspondence. I have received several letters on the subjects of knots two and six, which led me to think some further explanation desirable. In knot two I had intended the numbering of the houses to begin at one corner of the square, and this was assumed by most, if not all, of the competitors. Trojanus, however, says, assuming, in default of any information, that the street enters the square in the middle of each side, it may be supposed that the numbering begins at a street but surely the other is the more natural assumption in knot six the first problem was of course a mere jeu de mots whose presence i thought excusable in a series of problems whose aim is to entertain rather than to instruct but it has not escaped the contemptuous criticisms of two of my correspondents who seem to think that apollo is in duty bound to keep his bow always on the stretch neither of them has guessed it and this is true human nature only the other day, the 31st of September, to be quite exact, I met my old friend Brown and gave him a riddle I had just heard. With one great effort of his colossal mind, Brown guessed it. Right, said I. Ah, said he, it's very neat, very neat. And it isn't an answer that would occur to everybody. Very neat indeed. A few yards further on, I fell in with Smith, and to him I propounded the same riddle. He frowned over it for a minute, and then gave it up. Meekly I faltered out the answer. A poor thing, sir, Smith growled as he turned away. A very poor thing. I wonder you care to repeat such rubbish. Yet Smith's mind is, if possible, even more colossal than Brown's. The second problem of not six is an example in ordinary double rule of three, whose essential feature is that the result depends on the variation of several elements, which are so related to it that, if all but one be constant, it varies as that one. Hence, if none be constant, it varies as their product. Thus, for example, the cubical contents of a rectangular tank vary as its length, if breadth and depth be constant, and so on. Hence, if none be constant, it varies as the product of the length, breadth, and depth. When the result is not thus connected with the varying elements, the problem ceases to be double rule of three, and often becomes one of great complexity. To illustrate this, let us take two candidates for a prize, A and B, who are to compete in French, German, and Italian. A. Let it be laid down that the result is to depend on their relative knowledge of each subject, so that, whether their marks for French be 1, 2, or 100, 200, the result will be the same. And let it also be laid down that, if they get equal marks on two papers, the final marks are to have the same ratio as those of the third paper. This is a case of ordinary double rule of three. We multiply A's three marks together and do the same for B. Note that if A gets a single zero, his final mark is zero, even if he gets full marks for two papers, while B gets only one mark for each paper. This, of course, would be very unfair on A, though a correct solution under the given conditions. B. The result is to depend, as before, on relative knowledge but French is to have twice as much weight as German or Italian. This is an unusual form of question. I should be inclined to say, the resulting ratio is to be nearer to the French ratio than if we multiplied as in A, and so much nearer that it would be necessary to use the other multipliers twice to produce the same result as in A. That is, if the French ratio were two-tenths and the others two-ninths, one-ninth, 
so that the ultimate ratio by method a would be 2 over 45, I should multiply instead by 2 thirds, 1 third, giving the result, 1 third which is nearer to 2 tenths than if he had used method a. C. The result is to depend on actual amount of knowledge of the three subjects collectively. Here we have to ask two questions. 1. What is to be the unit, that is, standard to measure by, in each subject? 2. Are these units to be of equal or unequal value? The usual unit is the knowledge shown by answering the whole paper correctly, calling this 100. All lower amounts are represented by numbers between 0 and 100. Then, if these units are to be of equal value, we simply add A's three marks together and do the same for B. D. The conditions are the same as C, but French is to have double weight. Here we simply double the French marks and add as before. E. French is to have such weight that, if other marks be equal, the ultimate ratio is to be that of the French paper, so that a zero in this would swamp the candidate, but the other two subjects are only to affect the result collectively, by the amount of knowledge shown, the two being reckoned of equal value. Here I should add A's German and Italian marks together, and multiply by his French mark. But I need not go on. The problem may evidently be set with many varying conditions, each requiring its own method of solution. The problem in knot 6 was meant to belong to variety A, and to make this clear, I inserted the following passage. Usually the competitors differ in one point only. Thus, last year, Fifi and Gogo made the same number of scarves in the trial week, and they were equally light, but Fifi's were twice as warm as Gogo's, and she was pronounced twice as good. What I have said will suffice, I hope, as an answer to Balbus, who holds that A and C are the only possible varieties of the problem, and that to say, we cannot use addition, therefore we must be intended to use multiplication, is no more illogical than from knowledge that one was not born in the night to infer that he was born in the daytime and also to Fifi, who says, I think a little more consideration will show you that our error of adding the proportional numbers together for each candidate instead of multiplying is no error at all. Why, even if addition had been the right method to use, not one of the writers, I speak from memory, showed any consciousness of the necessity of fixing a unit for each subject. No error at all. They were positively steeped in error. One correspondent, I do not name him as the communication is not quite friendly in tone, writes thus, I wish to add, very respectfully, that I think it would be in better taste if you were to abstain from the very trenchant expressions which you are accustomed to indulge in when criticizing the answer. That such a tone must not be, be not, agreeable to the persons concerned who have made mistakes, may possibly have no great weight with you, but I hope you will feel that it would be as well not to employ it, unless you are quite certain of being correct yourself. The only instances the writer gives of the trenchant expressions are hapless and malefactors. I beg to assure him, and any others who may need the assurance, I trust there are none, that all such words have been used in jest, and with no idea that they could possibly annoy any one, and that I sincerely regret any annoyance I may have thus inadvertently given. May I hope that in future they will recognize the distinction between severe language used in sober earnest, and the words of unmeant bitterness, which Coleridge has alluded to in that lovely passage beginning, A little child, a limber elf. If the writer will refer to that passage, or to the preface to Fire, Famine, and Slaughter, he will find a distinction, for which I plead, far better drawn out than I could hope to do in any words of mine. The writer's insinuation that I care not how much annoyance I give to my readers, I think it best to pass over in silence, but to his concluding remark I must entirely demur. I hold that to use language likely to annoy any of my correspondents, would not be in the least justified by the plea that I was quite certain of being correct.
I trust that the knot untires and I are not on such terms as those. I beg to thank G. B. for the offer of a puzzle, which, however, is too like the old one, make four nines into one hundred. End of chapter 17《of a tangled tale this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by Hawaii in october two thousand nine a tangled tale by lewis carroll chapter eighteen answers to knot eight paragraph one the pigs problem place twenty-four pigs in four styes so that as you go round and round you may always find the number in each sty nearer to ten than the number in the last answer place eight pigs in the first sty ten in the second nothing in the third and six in the fourth ten is nearer ten than eight nothing is nearer ten than ten six is nearer ten than nothing and eight is nearer ten than six. This problem is noticed by only two correspondents. Balbus says, it certainly cannot be solved mathematically, nor do I see how to solve it by any verbal quibble. Nolan's Volans makes her radiancy change the direction of going round, and even then is obliged to add, the pigs must be carried in front of her. Paragraph 2. The Gramstiffs problem omnibuses start from a certain point both ways every fifteen minutes a traveller starting on foot along with one of them meets one in twelve and a half minutes when will he be overtaken by one answer in six minutes one quarter solution let a be the distance an omnibus goes in fifteen minutes and x the distance from the starting point to where the traveller is overtaken. Since the omnibus met is due at the starting point in two and a half minutes, it goes in that time as far as the traveller walks in twelve and a half, that is, it goes five times as fast. Now the overtaking omnibus is a behind the traveller when he starts, and therefore goes a plus x, while he goes x. Hence, a plus x equals 5x, that is, 4x equals a, and x equals a over 4. This distance would be traversed by an omnibus in 15 over 4 minutes, and therefore by the traveller in 5 times 15 over 4. Hence, he is overtaken in 18 minutes 3 quarters after starting, that is, in 6 minutes 1 quarter after meeting the omnibus. Four answers have been received, of which two are wrong. Dynamite rightly states that the overtaking omnibus reached the point where they met the other omnibus five minutes after they left, but wrongly concludes that, going five times as fast, it would overtake them in another minute. The travellers are five minutes' walk ahead of the omnibus, and must walk one-fourth of this distance farther before the omnibus overtakes them, which will be one-fifth of the distance traversed by the omnibus in the same time. This will require one minute one-quarter more. Nolan's Volans tries it by process like Achilles and the Tortoise. He rightly states that, when the overtaking omnibus leaves the gate, the travellers are one-fifth of A ahead, and that it will take the omnibus three minutes to traverse this distance, during which time the travellers, he tells us, go one-fifteenth of A, this should be one-twenty-fifth. The travellers being now one-fifteenth of A ahead, he concludes that the work remaining to be done is for the travellers to go one-sixtieth of A, while the omnibus goes one twelfth. The principle is correct and might have been applied earlier. Class list first Balbus Delta End of chapter eighteen Dean of A Tangled Tale This Librivox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hawaii in October 2009. A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll. Chapter 19. 
Answers to Knot 9. Paragraph 1. The Buckets. Problem. Lardner states that a solid, immersed in a fluid, displaces an amount equal to itself in bulk. How can this be true of a small bucket floating in a larger one? Solution. Lardner means by these places occupies a space which might be filled with water without any change in the surroundings. If the portion of the floating bucket which is above the water could be annihilated and the rest of it transformed into water, the surrounding water would not change its position, which agrees with Lardner's statement. Five answers have been received, none of which explains the difficulty arising from the well-known fact that a floating body is the same weight as the displaced fluid. Heckler says that only that portion of the smaller bucket which descends below the original level of the water can be properly said to be immersed, and only an equal bulk of water is displaced. Hence, according to Heckler, a solid whose weight was equal to that of an equal bulk of water would not float till the whole of it was below the original level of the water, but, as a matter of fact, it would float as soon as it was all under water. Magpie says the fallacy is the assumption that one body can displace another from a place where it isn't, and that Lardner's assertion is incorrect, except when the containing vessel was originally full to the brim. But the question of floating depends on the present state of things, not on past history. Old King Cole takes the same view as Heckler. Tympanum and Vindex assume that displaced means raised above its original level and merely explain how it comes to pass that the water, so raised, is less in bulk than the immersed portion of bucket and thus land themselves, or rather set themselves floating, in the same boat as Heckler. I regret that there is no class list to publish for this problem. Paragraph 2. Balbus's Essay Problem Balbus states that if a certain solid be immersed in a certain vessel of water, the water will rise through a series of distances, two inches, one inch, half an inch, etc., which series has no end. He concludes that the water will rise without limit. Is this true? Solution. No. This series can never reach four inches, since, however many terms we take, we are always short of four inches by an amount equal to the last term taken. Three answers have been received, but only two seem to me worthy of honors. Tympanum says that the statement about the stick is merely a blind to which the old answer may well be applied, solvitur ambulando, or rather mergendo. I trust Tympanum will not test this in his own person by taking the place of the man in Balbus's essay. He would infallibly be drowned. Old King Cole rightly points out that the series 2, 1, etc. is a decrease in geometrical progression, while Vindex rightly identifies the fallacy as that of Achilles and the Tortoise. Class List First, Old King Cole, Vindex. Paragraph 3. The Garden Problem. An oblong garden, half a yard longer than wide, consists entirely of a gravel walk, spirally arranged, a yard wide and 3,630 yards long. Find the dimension of the garden. Answer. 60, 60 and a half. Solution. The number of yards and fractions of a yard traversed in walking along a straight piece of walk is evidently the same as the number of square yards and fractions of a square yard contained in that piece of walk, and the distance traversed in passing through a square yard at a corner is evidently a yard. Hence the area of the garden is 3630 square yards, that is, if x be the width, x times the quantity x plus one half equals three thousand six hundred thirty solving this quadratic we find x equals sixty hence the dimensions are sixty sixty and a half twelve answers have been received seven right and five wrong c g l nabob old crow and tympanum assume that the number of yards in the length of the path is equal to the number of square yards in the garden this is true but should have been proved 
but each is guilty of darker deeds. CGL's working consists of dividing 3,630 by 60. Whence came this divisor, O Siegel? Divination? Or was it a dream? I fear this solution is worth nothing. Old Crow's is shorter, and so, if possible, worth rather less. He says the answer is at once seen to be 60 by 60 and a half. Nabob's calculation is short, but as rich as a nabob in error. He says that the square root of 3630 multiplied by 2 equals the length plus the breadth. That is, 60.25 times 2 equals 120 and a half. His first assertion is only true of a square garden. His second is irrelevant, since 60.25 is not the square root of 3630. Nay, Bob, this will not do. Timpanum says that, by extracting the square root of 3630, we get 60 yards with a remainder of 30 over 60, or half a yard, which we add so as to make the oblong 60 by 60 and a half. This is very terrible, but worse remains behind. Timpanum proceeds thus, but why should there be the half yard at all? Because without it there would be no space at all for flowers. By means of it, we find reserved in the very center a small plot of ground, two yards long by half a yard wide, the only space not occupied by walk. But Balbus expressly said that the walk used up the whole of the area. Oh, Timpanum, my timpa is exhausted, my brain is numb. I can say no more. Hecla indulges again and again in that most fatal of all habits in computation, the making two mistakes which cancel each other. She takes x as the width of the garden in yards, and x plus one half as its length, and makes her first coil the sum of x and a half, x and a half, x minus one, x minus one, that is four x minus three but the fourth term should be x minus one and a half, so that her first coil is half a yard too long. Her second coil is the sum of x minus two and a half, x minus two and a half, x minus three, x minus three. Here the first term should be x minus two, and the last x minus three and a half. These two mistakes cancel, and this coil is therefore right. And the same thing is true of every other coil but the last which needs an extra half yard to reach the end of the path, and this exactly balances the mistake in the first coil. Thus, the sum total of the coils comes right, though the working is all wrong. Of the seven who are right, Dynamite, Janet, Magpie, and Taffy make the same assumption as CGL and Co. They then solve by a quadratic. Magpie also tries it by arithmetical progression, but fails to notice that the first and last coils have special values. Alumnus Etonae attempts to prove what CGL assumes by a particular instance, taking a garden six by five and a half. He ought to have proved it generally, what is true of one number is not always true of others. Old King Cole solves it by an arithmetical progression. It is right, but too lengthy to be worth as much as a quadratic. Vindex proves it very neatly by pointing out that a yard of walk measured along the middle represents a square yard of garden. Whether we consider the straight stretches of walk or the square yards at the angles in which the middle line goes half a yard in one direction and then turns a right angle and goes half a yard in another direction. Class list. First, Vindex. Second, Alumnus Etonae, Old King Cole. Third, Dynamite, Janet, Magpie, Taffy. End of chapter 19. Tea of A Tangled Tale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hawaii in October 2009 A Tangled Tale by Lewis Carroll Chapter 20 Answers to Not 10 Paragraph 1 The Chelsea Pensioners Problem If 70% have lost an eye, 75% an ear, 80% an arm, 
eighty-five per cent a leg, what percentage, at least, must have lost all four? Answer. Ten. Solution. I adopt that of polar star as being better than my own. Adding the wounds together, we get 70 plus 75 plus 80 plus 85 equals 310 among 100 men, which gives 3 to each and 4 to 10 men. Therefore, the least percentage is 10. 19 answers have been received. One is 5, but as no working is given with it, it must, in accordance with the rule, remain a deed without a name janet makes it thirty-five and two-tenths i am sorry she has misunderstood the question and has supposed that those who had lost an ear were seventy-five per cent of those who had lost an eye and so on of course on this supposition the percentages must all be multiplied together this she has done correctly but i can give her no honours as i do not think the question will fairly bear her interpretation three score and ten makes it nineteen and two eighths her solution has given me i will not say many anxious days and sleepless nights for i wish to be strictly truthful but some trouble in making any sense at all of it she makes the number of pensioners wounded once to be three hundred ten per cent i suppose dividing by four she gets seventy seven and a half as average percentage Again dividing by four, she gets nineteen and two-eighths as percentage wounded four times. Does she suppose wounds of different kinds to absorb each other, so to speak? Then, no doubt, the data are equivalent to seventy-seven pensioners with one wound each, and a half-pensioner with a half-wound. And does she then suppose these concentrated wounds to be transferable, so that two-fourths of these unfortunates can obtain perfect health by handing over their wounds to the remaining one-fourth granting these suppositions her answer is right or rather if the question had been a road is covered with one inch of gravel along seventy-seven and a half per cent of it how much of it could be covered four inches deep with the same material her answer would have been right but alas that wasn't the question delta makes the most amazing assumptions let every one who has not lost an eye have lost an ear let every one who has not lost both eyes and ears have lost an arm her ideas of a battlefield are grim indeed fancy a warrior who would continue fighting after losing both eyes both ears and both arms this is a case which she or it evidently considers possible next come eight writers who have made the unwarrantable assumption that because seventy per cent have lost an eye therefore thirty per cent have not lost one so that they have both eyes this is illogical if you give me a bag containing one hundred sovereigns and if in an hour i come to you my face not beaming with gratitude nearly so much as when i receive the bag to say i am sorry to tell you that seventy of these sovereigns are bad do i thereby guarantee the other thirty to be good perhaps i have not tested them yet the signs of this illogical octagon are as follows in alphabetical order algernon bray dynamite g s c jane e j d w magpie who makes the delightful remark therefore ninety per cent have two of something recalling to one's memory that fortunate monarch with whom xerxes was so much pleased that he gave him ten of everything s s g and tokyo bradshaw of the future and t r do the question in a piecemeal fashion on the principle that the seventy per cent and the seventy five per cent though commenced at opposite ends of the one hundred must overlap by at least forty five per cent and so on this is quite correct working but not i think quite the best way of doing it the other five competitors will i hope feel themselves sufficiently glorified by being placed in the first class without my composing a triumphal ode for each class list first old cat old hen polar star simple susan white sugar second bradshaw of the future T.R. 
third algernon bray dynamite g s c jane e j d w magpie s s g tokyo paragraph two change of day i must postpone sine die the geographical problem partly because i have not yet received the statistics i am hoping for and partly because i am myself so entirely puzzled by it and when an examiner is himself dimly hovering between a second class and a third how is he to decide the position of others paragraph three the sun's ages problem at first two of the ages are together equal to the third a few years afterwards two of them are together double of the third when the number of years since the first occasion is two-thirds of the sum of the ages on that occasion one age is twenty-one what are the other two answer fifteen and eighteen solution let the ages at first be x y the quantity x plus y now if a plus b equals two c then the quantity a minus n plus the quantity b minus n equals two times the quantity c minus n whatever be the value of n hence the second relationship if ever true was always true hence it was true at first but it cannot be true that x and y are together double of the quantity x plus y hence it must be true of the quantity x plus y together with x or y and it does not matter which we take we assume then the quantity x plus y plus x equals two y that is y equals two x hence the three ages were at first x two x three x and the number of years since that time is two-thirds of six x that is is four x hence the present ages are five x six x seven x the ages are clearly integers since this is only the year when one of my sons comes of age hence seven x equals twenty one x equals three and the other ages are fifteen eighteen eighteen answers have been received one of the writers merely asserts that the first occasion was twelve years ago that the ages were then nine six and three and that on the second occasion they were fourteen eleven and eight as a roman father i ought to withhold the name of the rash writer but respect for age makes me break the rule it is three score and ten jane e also asserts that the ages at first were nine six three then she calculates the present ages leaving the second occasion unnoticed old hen is nearly as bad she tried various numbers till i found one that fitted all the conditions but merely scratching up the earth and pecking about is not the way to solve a problem o venerable bird and close after old hen prowls with hungry eyes old cat who calmly assumes to begin with that the son who comes of age is the eldest eat your bird puss for you will get nothing from me there are yet two zeros to dispose of minerva assumes that on every occasion a son comes of age and that it is only such a son who is tipped with gold is it wise thus to interpret now my boys calculate your ages and you shall have the money bradshaw of the future says let the ages at first be nine six three then assumes that the second occasion was six years afterwards and on these baseless assumptions brings out the right answers guide future travellers and thou wilt thou art no bradshaw for this age of those who win honours the merely honourable are two dynamite ascertains rightly the relationship between the three ages at first but then assumes one of them to be six thus making the rest of her solution tentative mfc does the algebra all right up to the conclusion that the present ages are five z six z and seven z it then assumes without giving any reason that seven z equals twenty one of the more honourable delta attempts a novelty to discover which son comes of age by elimination it assumes successively that it is the middle one and that it is the youngest 
and in each case it apparently brings out an absurdity. Still, as the proof contains the following bit of algebra, 63 equals 7x plus 4y, therefore 21 equals x plus 4 sevenths of y, I trust it will admit that its proof is not quite conclusive. The rest of its work is good. Magpie betrays the deplorable tendency of her tribe to appropriate any stray conclusion she comes across without having any strict logical right to it. Assuming A, B, C as the ages at first, and D as the number of the years that have elapsed since then, she finds, rightly, the three equations 2A equals B, C equals B plus A, D equals 2B. She then says, supposing that A equals 1, then B equals 2, C equals 3, and D equals 4. Therefore, for A, B, C, D, four numbers are wanted, which shall be to each other as 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. It is in the therefore that I detect the unconscientiousness of this bird. The conclusion is true, but this is only because the equations are homogeneous, that is, having one unknown in each term, a fact which I strongly suspect had not been grasped, I beg pardon, clawed, by her. Were I to lay this little pitfall, a plus 1 equals b, b plus 1 equals c, supposing a equals 1, then b equals 2, and c equals 3. Therefore, for a, b, c, three numbers are wanted, which shall be to one another as 1 to 2 to 3. Would you not flutter down into it, O magpie, as amiable as a dove? Simple Susan is anything but simple to me. After ascertaining that the three ages at first are as three to two to one, she says, then as two-thirds of their sum added to one of them equals twenty-one, the sum cannot exceed thirty, and consequently the highest cannot exceed fifteen. I suppose her mental argument is something like this. Two-thirds of sum plus one age equals twenty-one. Therefore, sum plus three halves of one age equals thirty-one and a half but three halves of one age cannot be less than one and a half here i perceive that simple susan would on no account present a guinea to a newborn baby hence the sum cannot exceed thirty this is ingenious but her proof after that is as she candidly admits clumsy and roundabout she finds that there are five possible sets of ages, and eliminates four of them. Suppose that, instead of five, there had been five million possible sets. Would simple Susan have courageously ordered in the necessary gallon of ink and ream of paper? The solution sent in by C.R. is, like that of simple Susan, partly tentative, and so does not rise higher than being clumsily right. Among those who have earned the highest honors, Algonon Bray solves the problem quite correctly, but adds that there is nothing to exclude the supposition that all the ages were fractional. This would make the number of answers infinite. Let me meekly protest that I never intended my readers to devote the rest of their lives to writing out answers. E. M. Ricks points out that, if fractional ages be admissible, any one of the three sons might be the one come of age, but she rightly rejects this supposition on the ground that it would make the problem indeterminate. White Sugar is the only one who has detected an oversight of mine. I had forgotten the possibility, which of course ought to be allowed for, that the son, who came of age that year, need not have done so by that day, so that he might be only twenty. This gives a second solution, that is, twenty, twenty-four, twenty-eight. Well said, pure crystal. Verily, thy fair discourse hath been as sugar. Class list. First, Algonon Bray, an old fogey, E. M. Ricks, G. S. C., S. S. G., Tokyo, T. R., White Sugar. Second, C. R., Delta, Magpie, Simple Susan. Third, Dynamite, MFC. I have received more than one remonstrance on my assertion in the Chelsea pensioners' problem 
that it was illogical to assume from the datum seventy per cent have lost an eye that thirty per cent have not algernon bray states as a parallel case suppose tommy's father gives him four apples and he eats one of them how many has he left and says i think we are justified in answering three i think so too there is no must here and the data are evidently meant to fix the answer exactly but if the question were set me how many must he have left i should understand the data to be that his father gave him four at least but may have given him more i take this opportunity of thanking those who have sent along with their answers to the tenth knot regrets that there are no more knots to come or petitions that i should recall my resolution to bring them to an end i am most grateful for their kind words but i think it wisest to end what at best was but a lame attempt the stretched metre of an antique song is beyond my compass and my puppets were neither distinctly in my life like those i now address nor yet like alice and the mock turtle distinctly out of it yet let me at least fancy as i lay down the pen that i carry with me into my silent life dear reader a farewell smile from your unseen face and a kindly farewell pressure from your unfelt hand and so good night parting is such sweet sorrow that i shall say good night till it be morrow end of chapter twenty end of a tangled tale by lewis carroll thanks for listening